Hi everyone, welcome back. This is the last session for the book of Ruth, the big message in a short story. Last session we looked at Acts 1 and 2 of the book and we learned that Ruth's devotion to Naomi was not simply out of a relationship or affection for her, but as an act of devotion to the God of Israel. Ruth establishes herself as part of God's people, and she's now included under God's covenantal faithfulness, protection, and provision. God provides for Ruth by sending Boaz, a man from Bethlehem, the tribe of Judah, to be the family's guardian redeemer. The same Hebrew word used to describe Boaz's loyalty and kindness is the same uh, word used throughout the Old Testament in reference to God's character as abounding in steadfast love. And we saw that God is not faithful to us simply because he does not break his promises, but because he deeply loves us and wants to keep this relationship that he himself established between us. So this session, we're going to look at Acts 3, 4, and the epilogue. But before we get started, let's open with a word of prayer. God, you are so good. We acknowledge that we are only scratching the surface of the depth of who you are, but one day we will see you face to face. Thank you that you had a plan from the very beginning to redeem and to restore your people from our brokenness and shame. And we ask that as we open your word today, we'd be able to see this plan in this short book of Ruth. Remind us of your presence today and it is in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Well, I am so excited about this session and can't wait to jump in. This is the last session, so you already know what to do. Grab your Bibles, download the handout from the website, and let's get started. Well, last session we were introduced to a man named Boaz, and he was described by a very specific phrase, a man of noble character. Now, keep this in your mind because it's going to be very important in just a minute. So Act 3 begins, and we see that Naomi is making plans for Ruth to marry Boaz. And it's not out of the ordinary for Naomi to be involved. In fact, it was always uh, the duty of the parents to arrange marriages for their children. Now, since Ruth has no parents in this situation, Ruth is assuming this responsibility and she instructs Ruth to meet Boaz on the threshing floor in the middle of the night. And this is a specific time during harvest season where the workers of the field and the owners of the field would get together and they'd have a large celebration with lots of great food and lots of wine. And it seems that Naomi knows exactly what happens on the threshing floor. She knows that everyone is going to be in good spirits, as the text says, and she thinks that Boaz might be in a more generous mood to accept a, uh, a large request, such as becoming someone's guardian redeemer. Well, when I went through the book of Ruth for the first time, I was thinking, why doesn't Ruth just go and approach Boaz herself and ask him herself, you know, in the in broad daylight when, when Boaz is, you know, not under the influence, has all of his wits about him? Well, culturally speaking, it would have been impossible for Ruth and Boaz to have a private conversation, and it would have seemed a little bit inappropriate for Naomi to, to approach him herself as well. So Ruth instructs, um, or Naomi instructs Ruth to go and meet Boaz on the threshing floor and lay at his feet. Well, there's this common speculation among biblical scholars that feet could have been some euphemism for some sexual act. And although we're not sure that this is actually the case, uh, we feel how, how culturally shocking this moment is, right? It's taking so much courage for Ruth to go and meet Boaz this way. She's, she's risking so much, you know, but she doesn't know that Boaz, you know, might get angry and, and lash out and, and say, you never glean my fields again. Or, you know, she doesn't know that, that Boaz might, you know, take advantage of her and leave her in a worse position than she was before. But, but Ruth trusts God that God will provide for her and protect her in this moment. So this is um, what happens next. Open your Bibles with me to uh, Ruth chapter 3 beginning in verse uh, seven. So this is how Boaz responds to Ruth's, uh, Ruth's act here. So this is the word of the Lord in verse seven. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly 
uncovered his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. "'Who are you?' he asked. "'I am your servant, Ruth,' she said. "'Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family.'" "'The Lord bless you, my daughter,' he replied. "'This kindness uh, is greater than that which you showed earlier. "'You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. "'And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. "'I will do for you all that you ask. "'All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character.'" Now, this is how, how Boaz responds. She, he accepts all that Ruth requests, and he refers to her as a woman of noble character. Now, if you remember, this is the same phrase used to describe Boaz in chapter 2, a, woman, a man of noble character, a man of chayil, as we saw. And so now Ruth is called a woman of noble character, character or a woman of chayil. Now, this fact is extremely important because this phrase appears only twice in the whole Bible, once here in reference to Ruth and the other in Proverbs chapter 31. Now, we've said before, the biblical authors are brilliant because they are guided by the Holy Spirit and um, they always have a specific intention for everything that they include. So turn with me to Proverbs chapter 31, uh, beginning in verse 10. Uh, this is the word of the Lord, beginning in verse 10. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. Now the text goes on to describe all the work that she does and there's all this imagery of, of wealth and honor and her thriving business at the city gate. Um, let's pick up in, uh, let's skip down to verse 25 here. She's clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done. Let her works bring her praise at the city gate." Now, how amazing is this? Ruth, a, a widowed Moabite foreigner who by culture standards should have been the lowest of the low of society is now given the highest regard of honor. Her story is completely redeemed. The personification of wisdom here in Proverbs chapter 31 is still to this day in Jewish culture, the highest praise that a woman could receive. It was sets impossible standards for women then and women now, but the text is clear. There's nothing that Ruth did to deserve this title. She was, she was not gathering, you know, wool and flax and, and, and gathering food from afar like a merchant ship. She was simply faithful to God. Now, this is so culturally upside down. I, this is what the kingdom of God is like, and this is good news for us. We might think, you know, I don't do enough. I don't, I'm not a good, good enough Christian. I, I've messed up too much in the past, and, you know, I'm too far gone. But God is in the business of redeeming stories. Our slates are wiped completely clean. We're clothed with strength and dignity, and our worth is more than rubies and gold. And so how do we respond to this radical redemption of our stories in, in love and faithfulness? We listen to God's voice, and we obey how he's commanded us to live. Just like Ruth was faithful and entrusted God in this in this moment. So we trust God in our lives today. And this is not out of obligation, but out of a, a devotion and love for God. 
So our story continues. We are now moving to act four of the book. And here, Boaz accepts the responsibility of becoming Ruth and Naomi's guardian redeemer. He marries Ruth and he buys back the land uh, from her father-in-law, Elimelech. And so he's therefore uh, accepting all these responsibilities of the Goel, the guardian redeemer, as described throughout the Old Testament. And they make their marriage known to the whole town of Bethlehem, uh, including the elders. And the people of Bethlehem uh, bless the couple with a very specific blessing, which we'll pick up reading in Ruth uh, chapter 4. So Ruth chapter 4, we're going to pick up in verse uh, 9. This is the word of the Lord. When Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malone. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malone's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. This is fulfilling um, the responsibilities as the guardian redeemer. So let's go on in verse 11. When the elders and all the people at the gate said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathath and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Now, this phrase, may your family be like that of Perez, is so interesting. Like we've said before, the biblical authors are so brilliant. They're guided by the Holy Spirit, and so they always have a specific intention for everything that they include. So we should be looking for clues and echoes and quotations throughout the Bible um, in their words when we read. So where else have we heard about the family of Perez? Well, the beginning of Ruth's narrative uh, it began with um, a family from Bethlehem, the tribe of Judah, whose two sons married Canaanite women, and those two sons ended up dying. There's another story with a similar plot line that has to do with the family of Perez. It's a very strange story in Genesis chapter 38 about a man named Judah, who was the son of Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons who established the 12 tribes of Israel. But in this story, Judah, um, he gives his two sons a Canaanite woman named Tamar to be their wife. Both of those two sons ended up dying. And so Judah himself um, sleeps with his daughter-in-law and um, she becomes pregnant with twin boys. So I, I told you it's strange. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 38. And we'll pick up in verse 27. And this is the story of um, Tamar giving birth. So uh, Genesis chapter 38, beginning in verse 27, this is the word of the Lord. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand. So the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it on his wrist and said, this one came out first. But when he drew back his hand, his brother came out and she said, so this is how you have broken out. And his name was Perez. Then his brother, who had the scarlet thread on his wrist, came out, and his name was Zerah. So Perez, in Hebrew, um, this name, it means breaking out, or he who bursts forth. So why is this strange story important? Why does the author of Ruth want us to have this story in our minds as we read her narrative? Well, the last time that we heard about the birth of twin boys was in Genesis chapter 25, just a few uh, chapters before. And this was the story of Jacob and Esau. These two sw twins struggled in the womb, just like Perez and Zerah did. But Jacob was going to be the father of 12 sons who established the 12 tribes of Israel, like we said. So, Towards the end of Jacob's life, he gives um, each of his 12 sons a specific blessing. But there was one blessing that stood out among the rest as being the most important and carrying the most weight. And if you can guess, this was to his son, Judah. This, is, uh, this occurs in Genesis chapter 49. So let's skip forward. Genesis 49. 
and will read the blessing that he gives to his son Judah. This is so powerful. So read with me in um, Genesis 49, starting in verse 8. This is the word of the Lord. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down, like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch, he will wash his garments in wine, his, gropes, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. So I'll have you fill this on, in on your handout. There are three important things that we learn from this blessing to Judah. The first is that Judah will have victory over his enemies. Second is that Judah will be like a lion and third, Judah will rule the Judah's family line will rule the nations forever in robes of purple. So let's pause for a moment because there is a lot going on here. We just read the story of um, Judah and Tamar and their strange way of conceiving twins. That story is important because of the promise given to Judah's family line here in what that we read in Genesis 49. Now, this blessing is so important because of a promise made to Adam and Eve way back in Genesis chapter 3. I know, it's if you're tracking with me, this is really exciting here. So in Genesis chapter 3, God, or in, in the book of Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve, God creates the heavens and the earth. And out of God's great love and desire to multiply this love, he created humans in his image to, to cultivate his earth, to rule over the living creatures, and to be in relationship with him. But love must be sincere. So God created humans with free will to love and to serve him if they choose. God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, a place where they could enjoy God's presence fully, and he had one condition. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or rather that Adam and Eve would recognize their place as God's servants, that God would be the only one who would hold all knowledge and all sovereignty. Well, the humans, uh, these first humans, they used their free will to reject God and to, to disobey him. This, the serpent in this story is this picture of temptation and evil. And the serpent persuades Adam and Eve to, to disobey God. And the consequence of that rejection was a separation from God. And sin and, and death and sickness and pain entered the world. But that is not the end of the story. God curses the serpent and promises something extremely powerful to Adam and Eve. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 3 together. And we will read the, the curse that God gives the serpent and really the promise that he gives Adam and Eve. So turn with me, Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 14. This is the word of the Lord. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is incredibly important to us because evil is not the end of the story. Evil will take hold of humankind only momentarily. He'll strike the heel, but eventually the offspring will crush head, the head of, of evil, saying that evil will be completely destroyed and goodness will win this fight. Now, I want us to hear this promise through ancient uh, Jewish or Israelite ears, okay? Every moment from here on out, they're, they're crying out, they're, Lord, where is this promise? Where is the seed of the woman that will crush 
evil. We we hear the the echoes and the and the quotations and the anticipation of of this promise to, of the seed of the woman throughout the Bible, through the prophets and and narratives and the wisdom literature. We're waiting, right? This this anticipation feels so real. The message is so urgent, so transformative, so palpable to to Jewish to Jewish ears. And so we see in Ruth's narrative that the that this anticipation is real. So turn with me back to Ruth chapter four. And let's read this little, you know, sticky note at the end of Ruth's narrative. It's the genealogy, one of our favorite, you know, passages to read in the Bible, the genealogies. But this is so important. I hope you see the excitement in this. So turn with me to Ruth chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 18. This is the word of the Lord. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Simon, Simon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. Now, if we read Matthew's gospel, the first couple of lines of the New Testament, there's this big red flashing sign saying the seed of the woman has come. Matthew chapter 1 verses 1 through 16 trace the genealogy from Abraham to Jacob to to Jacob and Judah, Judah, Tamar, Perez, Ruth, and Boaz to King David to Jesus Christ himself, the Messiah. The Messiah has come. Cue the celebration because (laughs) Jesus Christ fulfills the promise given to uh, Judah and Tamar, given to Judah's family line, and the promise given to Adam and Eve. And if you remember, the the, um, offspring of Judah's family line would have victory over his enemies, would be like a lion, and his family line would rule the nations forever. So write this down on your handout. Jesus Christ crushes evil by his sacrifice on the cross and the forgiveness of sins for the whole world. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Sinners who went their own way would enjoy perfect presence with God once more. That's the first thing. The second is that Jesus is called the Lion of Judah. In Revelation 5.5, it says, See, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. And finally, Jesus is the King of all kings who reigns forever over all nations in the kingdom of heaven. So, what is the big message of hope in this short story. What message of of hope can we gain from reading the book of Ruth? What comfort and joy do we do we read from 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 this this section of scripture? It's this. God keeps his promises. Evil will not win. Death is not the end of the story. Through the life death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, those who believe will enjoy perfect presence with God in the kingdom of heaven, the restored garden of Eden. So turn with me to Revelation 22, starting in verse 3. This is what heaven is going to be like. This is the restored garden of Eden. (laughs) Starting in verse 3, this is the word of the Lord. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Friends, I I want us to hear this today. 
This is what is promised to those who put their trust in God, the creator of heavens, of the heavens and the earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God at work in the lives of Judah and Tamar, the God at work in the lives of Ruth and Boaz, the, the fulfiller of the promises, the person of Jesus Christ, the lion of Judah, the alpha and the omega. This is the same God at work in you and me. And so I want us to walk away, not only with the knowledge of the connection between Ruth and Jesus, but that it would sink deep into our hearts and that we'd let it change our lives. When this, when this truth becomes real to us, we cannot help but give our lives to this incredibly personal God. And so this is where we will conclude our session today. But before we do, I would love for us to just close with a word of prayer, praising God for who he is and what he has done. Father, we, you are so good. We praise you for what you've done. We praise you for the ways that you've revealed yourself to your people throughout history bringing about your plan to redeem and to restore this world. God, we, we thank you that you are a God who keeps your promises. And we pray with everything that we have in us that, you would, that your kingdom would come, that your will be done. Lord, we acknowledge that you are coming soon. And this message is incredibly urgent for us to share this hope with those who do not yet know you. Lord, but fill us with your strength as we carry this message to the world. And Lord, we cannot wait for your kingdom. We long for your kingdom and we pray that we would one day see you face to face. Lord, it is everything that we have that we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for viewing the teaching online. Please join us for a time of discussion beginning at 6.30 p.m. To join, visit our Wednesday Night at Shoreline online page on our website and click Join Discussion for this particular teaching on the book of Ruth. We're so excited to spend some time with all of you reflecting on the things that we've learned from this particular teaching. See you there.